uh, do you see the slide? Yes, I do. Do you see the mouse pointer? I do. Okay, let me start. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sang Kuk Choi from Brookhaven National Lab. And today I will talk about the introduction to the first principles and the dynamic mean field theory. So this is the outline of my talk. First, I will give you some brief introduction and motivation why we <clears throat> are interested in strongly correlated material and what kind of tool do we have and how it performs. And in the next, uh, for the next topic, I will talk about the formal point of viewpoint on the first principles and, time, and dynamical mean field theory. And then in the afternoon session, I will give you a tutorial on the LDE plus CMFT as well as LKSGW plus TMFT. Okay, let's start with our Hamiltonian. So what Hamiltonian do we have to solve? So the Hamiltonian we are interested in is to describe the electron behavior in real material. In real material, we have so many electrons. So we, in the first term, we have electron kinetic term, and we also have the electron ion interaction, and we also have electron electron interaction, and we have ion kinetic term, and we have ion ion interaction term. So this is the Hamiltonian for the condensed matter theorist, and this is the Hamiltonian we wanna solve. But to solve this problem exactly is a notoriously hard problem. So let's see how it is hard and why it is hard from the viewpoint of the exact diagonalization. So we have this many body Hamiltonian, and let's just say that we want to diagonalize this Hamiltonian uh, exactly. That in the cases, the ba proper basis that will be the Slater determinant. And let's just say that we have, we are starting with the n number of single particle basis function. And there are, let's just say that we have n number of electrons. Then the number of Slater determinant we should construct is m choose n. And when n goes to large, then, then it means that it goes exponentially as a function of n. For example, for the two carbon, only two carbon atom with the number of electrons of 12 and number of the single particle basis function of 36, the basis set size will be 10 to the nine determinants. So this is almost impossible. So it means that it is really hard to solve this problem exactly. So then it means that there is no hope to solve this problem? Probably not. So we can get some hint when we take a look at the angle reserved photo emission measurement for, of simple metal. So simple metal is a system we usually solve within so-called non-interacting approaches. In the non-interacting approaches, what we do is we just simply neglect electron-electron interaction terms, then we just solve the problem. In the cases, what we have is we will have parabolic band structure. So if you calculate each spectral function, which is the imaginary part of the Green's function, then it, at each K point, we will have this sharp peak of which uh, this version will be parabolic. So on, under the chemical potential, we have the elect uh, holes and above the chemical potential, we will have electrons and they will follow uh, the parabolic band structure. And if we measure each spectral function from RPS measurement, which is direct measure of the imaginary part of the, uh, the Green's function, there is some similarity between its measured RPS spectra and the, the, the non-interacting theory. One thing we can notice here is that near the chemical potential, what you can see there is that there is, there is really sharp peak, which is one-to-one -one correspondence to the non-interacting particle. So we can see that, but however, their band structure or their uh, effective mass will be renormalized and there will be finite width for their, this, these peaks. However, there will be one to one correspondence. So do we have theoretical background between these two, between further, further this, for this one to one correspondence? Yes, that is so-called Fermi liquid theory. So Fermi liquid theory is based on the so-called adiabatic continuity. So for the adiabatic continuity, we have really good example for the even in the uh, 
single electron problem, which is electron inner potential wall. When we have box potential, and if we solve this problem, then we will have the eigen state, which is looking like this. For the ground state, it will have no node. And for the first excited state, it will have one node. And second excited state, we will have two nodes, and so on. And what it can do is we might be able to change the shape of the external potential from box potential to this harmonic potential. If we change the shape of this potential really, really, really slowly, then what you can see there is that the eigen state will be looking like this. But interestingly, what you can see there is that their ground state in the harmonic potential will be also like this. For the ground state, it will be no node. And for the first excited state, it will be one node. And for the second excited state, it will have two nodes. But interesting thing is that although their eigen spectra energy level position will change and their exact wave function shape will be changed, However, their label, which is the number of nodes, will be preserved if we change their, uh, their external potential really, really, really slowly. That means adiabatic continuity. But this kind of adiabatic continuity idea can be applied to the many body electron problems. The idea is like this. So we first think about the non-interacting system where we neglect the electron-electron interaction terms. And let's just say that we turn on the electron-electron interaction term really, 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 really slowly. So in the cases between the non-interacting system and the interacting system, there will be some common thing. For example, there will be conservation. Law. For example, momentum, total momentum, total energy, and so on. But this conservation law are related to the quantum number, which will play the role of these labels in this one particle problem so that, uh, so that there will be these two systems may be labeled by the same quantum number. But if, if it is the case, then we can solve the problem under the <coughs> uh, condition that we'll, we will uh, satisfy, electronically satisfy Pauli exclusion principles. And but however, as I told you in the one electron particle system, the eigen spectrum will be changing so that if we take a look at the excitation, then there will be not real bare particle, but it will be quasi particle with the renormalized mass and the finite lifetime. However, with this low energy excitation of quasi particle, we might be able to understand the electron behavior in real material. This was quite successful story to uh, theory to understand the weakly correlated material and working horse for this theory will be density functional theory and then GW theory. Okay, what is a density functional theory? There are so many different ways of understanding density functional theory, but one way to understand it is just saying like this. So this is a theory for the ground state property of weakly correlated material. So what they do is as follows. Instead of solving the many electron problems, they solve non-interacting auxiliary problem on the so-called constant potential here. And from the constant potential, they calculate the non-interacting constant wave function. And from there, they calculate density. And they assume that this density is the same as the density of the uh, fully interacting many body system. So if we apply this method to real material, and for, if we predict their ground state properties, it is working really well for the weakly correlated material. For example, if we predict the structure of the silicon, it turns out that within this theory, the hexagonal diamond structure is the ground state. And if we calculate its phonon band structure based on this theory, as you can see here, match between theory and experiments are quite good. And here I note that quantum energy and wave function are not exactly quasi particle energy and wave function. And next working words is GW theory. What is GW theory? So GW theory tells us that self and if we expand the self energy with, with, with fully screened Coulomb interaction W, if we keep the first order expansion, then that is our GW self energy. And if we neglect all the high order term, and if we calculate its spectral function for the weakly correlated material, it turns out the match is really good. For example, if we calculate the spectral function of germanium, and if we 
make a comparison between theory and experiments, they match is really, really good. So this is the nowadays standard <coughs> theory for predicting the excited state property of weakly correlated material. However, this is not the end of the story. So as I told you, here we have a non-interacting spectral function. And for the weakly correlated material, for the state near the chemical potential, we have quasi-particle peak here so that we can understand the property of weakly correlated material from the some kind of mean field theory, such as Hartree Fock, DFT, GW, or whatever. However, there is also some other classes of material, which is so-called strongly correlated material. So in this classes of material, what we know is that this kind of perturbative approaches lower the expansion <coughs> around the, this mean field, Hartree Fock, DFT, or GW does not work. And if we calculate, if we measure the spectral function, and if we make a comparison of spectral function between the non-interacting system to the strongly correlated system, as you can see here, there is no continuity. For example, at this K point, we had one peak here. However, in these cases, we have two peak. This is the extreme cases. And this system is known to really sensitive to small changes in their control parameters, resulting in larger responses. And it has many applications like oxide electronics, high temperature superconductor, and spintronic devices. Okay. So then where can we find the strong correlation behavior? Usually for the material with transition metal, lanthanide elements, and arcanide elements show the strong correlation behavior. And in common, what they have is that they have open D and F subshell in it. So what's happening in the open D and open F subshell? So we can understand the behavior of electron in this subshell from two different reference system. One is the one reference system will be banned where electron are itinerant, and the other extreme reference system will be atom. In this cases, we have localized electron, then we will have a multiplex. So for the band electron, what you can see there is that ground state will be non-degenerate, so that single slayer determinant will be enough to describe the ground state properties. However, for the localized electron, for the multiplex, what you can see there is that their ground state will be degenerate, so to describe the ground state, it will be linear combination of many Slater determinants. But what's happening in the open D and open F subshell system is that electrons are neither fully itunes nor are fully localized. So to describe their behavior, we should have some means to this dual character, character of the localized electron as well as character of the itunes electron. So do we have some theoretical to describe these dual characters? Yes, we do. That is so-called dynamical mean field theory. Dynamical mean field theory is efficient uh, theoretical tool to describe these dual characters. So this is so-called effective action of dynamical mean field theory. But what you can see there is as follows. This effective uh, action is composed of two terms. For the first term, we have atom-like uh, terms. We have U term with electron density for the up electron and electron density for the down electron. So this is explicitly electron-electron interaction terms. And if we solve this one only, then it will show just multiple so that this is atom-like behavior. And for the other terms, we have one creation and one annihilation inter uh, uh, operator. So it means that it describes electron hopping. So it can give us a description for the band-like behavior. So what it, it actually do is the, within the dynamic mean field theory, it just maps the quantum many body, many electron problem to quantum impurity problem in an effective field. And the as a result of that, we will have local approximation to the self energy and other quantities, which means no K dependence. Here K is crystal momentum. However, there are various non-local extensions are available here. Okay, 
So using this kind of uh, using uh, dynamic mean field theory, there are many, many successful theories that are available. However, two important thing is the behavior of motor insulator and the, the so-called the, the notion of the Huntmeyer. So motor insulator picture is really important to understand the model compound of Cupri superconductor, which and <coughs> motor insulator is uh, a reference picture to understand Cupri physics. So in this case, if we just fix the chemical potential position, and if we fix the bandwidth, and if we increase the Coulomb interaction from zero to finite value, as you can see here, there is the evolution of density of state from the, this kind of dome shape, like shape, and in the intermediate U value, we have upper Harvard band and lower Harvard band with the positive particle P here. And later, finally, when U is really large, we will have only see the upper and lower half of the band. And there is also a successful story to understand the, the iron-based superconductor and the lucinate. So iron -based, for the iron-based superconductor and lucinate, it has been known that its correlation is controlled by the Hunt J, not the onside U column Hubbard U. But what I can see there is that if we increase the J value from zero to the finite value, as you can see here, when J becomes large, G factor decreases. It means that correlation are coming from the J. And at the same time, critical U value, where we can open the moat gap, are uh, getting increases, which means that we are getting away from the moat transition. So that this is a real signature of the Hunt metal. And all these ideas are coming from the dynamic mean field theory approaches. So far, I have showed you the, the dynamic mean field theory and its local self energy and its successful stories. However, there are some systems where the non local correlation is also important. One example is the pseudo gap behavior in the cupids. From its mother compound, if we adopt the system, then this is their <coughs> Fermi surface. However, they don't show the first and Fermi surface, but there is a big intensity in this K point. However, near this here, its intensity is suppressed. But if we approach this system within the dynamic mean field theory where the self energy is local, then as you can see here, we have still have finite uh, spectra at this K point. So it means that maybe this kind of discrepancy are coming from the non-local correlation, which is missing in the dynamic mean field theory. There are many way, different ways to extend the dynamic mean field theory for the study of non-local correlation. One idea is as follows. Instead of the treating the impurity atom sitting on the same atom as our real impurity, we can do that. We can treat the uh, correlated material sitting on different atom as a one single impurity, and we can solve the dynamic mean field theory problem. And this is so called the cellular DMFT approaches, which this is a real safe space expansion. And there is also complementary approaches where the, we can the, extend the dynamic mean field theory idea in the K space that is so called the dynamical cluster approximation. And so there is, uh, but instead of this kind of real and the case basis extension approaches, we can also include the non local correlation uh, diagrammatically. And the idea is as follows uh, We just pick the one quantity and we say that that quantity is local. And from the relation between the Feynman diagram, we can restore the non local self energy as well as the non local polarizability. And we can get some non locality in the correlation. And as you can see, one example is the GW plus EDMFT and trilax and quadrilax and D gamma A and so on. But here is one demonstration that if we just apply this GW plus EDMFT approaches for the Hubbard model, and if we calculate its spectra, as you can see, here, there is some suppression of the uh, spectral weight at this K point. Okay, so far I have give, given you the introduction or motivation of the GW uh, first principle approaches and dynamic mean field theory. And from now on, I will give you four more viewpoint on the first principle approaches and the dynamic mean field theory. And here is the important references. And maybe if you need more detailed uh, 
uh, information, then you can take a look at these references. Okay, let me go on. If you have, guys have any questions, just feel free to ask me. So I have the introduced your first principle approaches and then the dynamic community theory. So first principle approach is a really good tool to describe icon state without any external parameters. And we have a dynamic mean field theory, which is good for describing correlated electron state. Then how do we combine these two different theories? The approach is based on the idea of divide and concord. So in real material, even in the correlated material, not all the electrons are correlated, but some are correlated and all the, all the less electrons are itinerant. So basic idea is for the itinerant state, we use first principle approaches, DFT or GW. And for the correlated state, we just use the idea of dynamic mean field theory. So if we combine these two different ideas, then we can have two different output uh, product. One is the DFT plus DMFT, and the other one is GW plus EDMFT. But what you, can, what you should remember is that once we divide this Hilbert space into two parts, and for the correlated state, we should have some really well-defined route to define the quantum impurity problem for the dynamic mean field theory. We should remember that. And between these two approaches, there is trade-off between the speed and accuracy. And if we combine these two different methodology and there are many interesting outputs, for example, if we apply this methodology to real material of lantern copper oxide, and this is the comparison between theory and experiments. For the theory, we have LDA results and LDA plus CMFT and LKSGW. I will describe later what that is. And, and you got the, the introduction from Andre yesterday on this methodology. And we also have LKSGW plus CMFT. So we have two different lines for each methodology. Full line means paramagnetic phase or non-magnetic phase calculation results. And decimal line is the anti ferromagnetic uh, phase calculation. So within the LDA, what you can see here is that if you apply this method, no matter, no matter we have spin polarization or not, it just say that this material is metal, which is inconsistent with the, uh, which is not consistent with the, 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 the experimental result, which is the dotted line here. We see that the spectral weight at the chemical potential is really suppressed. And if you apply LDA plus CMFT, then we can see that there is gap opening, multi gap opening quite, quite well. However, this oxygen P peak position and lantern F peak position is really, really far from the experiments here. And if we, can, if we apply the LQS GW methodology, what you can see there is that for the paramagnetic phase calculation or non magnetic phase calculation, which is the, the the full line, right? The full line here, we it says that it is metal, so this is not consistent. But if we, but if we, if we uh, turn on the spin polarization, then there is gap opening. And if we apply, if we combine GW and DMFT and apply this method, method, then the gap opens well, no matter whether we have spin polarization or not, and the lantern F peak as well as oxygen P peak position uh, aligns well to the experiments. And another example is iron antimony two. This is really important material for the, the thermoelectric application. And this, we, we can just make a comparison between the theory and experiments. So here we have experiments along the specific K, K line, which is between S, Y, S line. And from the RPS measurement, what we can see there is that we have three bands. We have one flat band there, and we have two uh, dispersive band. And the way how these two bands are touching here is that it's like a point. If you apply LDA and BJ potential, then as you can see here in this energy range, we only see two uh, bands and the way how they touching each other is not consistent. And if we apply LQSGW, then as you can see here, we will still have two bands and the way how these two bands are touching each other is not consistent with the experiments. And if we apply LQS G double plus DMFT, then the way how they touching each other is matching well to experiments, as well as we should we are seeing three bands. And so in that way, we can validate our theories. 
And another important application um, is that, yes, correct. There's a question. Um, two slides ago, mm -hmm. the uh, student is wondering if the non magnetic state should have a band gap or not. Oh, uh, okay. Let me see if I can read the chat. Which, okay. Should non magnetic state in the last line supposed to have a band gap? E, for the lantanium, <coughs> lantanium copper oxide, experimentally, it has been known that uh, we just, uh, if we just increase the temperature, then, then we, should, we sh are supposed to see the band gap. Experimentally, it has been known. Gamma band. Gamma band is. Oh, so we have another question from Sun Sop, and it's about his question is. Regarding the RPS results of iron antimony to gamma band is captured by the DMFT, not by other method. Is the gamma band a type of the Herbert band? So what I can tell you is as follows. If I remember correct, all alpha, beta, gamma bands are due to the iron D orbital. And if you apply DMFT, then what it can do, what it can do, what should what we should see is that we should be uh, the the uh, band mass should be enhanced due to the correlation so that uh, the gamma band position will be more close to chemical potential. That's the reason why the gamma band within the LQS GW plus DMFT is more better than any other approaches. I hope this, if you have any other questions, please let me know. Okay, otherwise I will continue. This means I come up and this away from the window. Yes, yes, from other method, there, there are gamma band, but they are far from their chemical potential. It doesn't mean that they, they are not able to see the gamma band, but their position is not correct. Okay, I will continue. So another application we can do is the low dimensional system. So in this project, what it did is we just studied the ferromagnetism in the suspended vanadium selenide monolayer. So this is an important material because it has been, uh, people have suspected that we, 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 might, we will be able to see the magnetism in the monolayer limit. But one important thing in this system is that in the bulk, there is no magnetism. However, when they, they reduce the dimensionality to the two dimension, then experimentally it has been uh, <coughs> claimed that there is a magnetism. So in this project, we just studied the origin of the, the formation of local moment in this system. And with this tool, we can calculate the, uh, the, the kneel temperature as well as we can just reserve the uh, the, the contribution from the uh, dimensionality as well as the, the electron and electron interaction to the formation of the local moments. And this could be one example that I can show you. And then another example that I can show you is this. So I have introduced you that there is so, uh, so, so tools which is so-called G double plus E DMFT. But this is really demanding uh, computationally as well as theoretically. But if we combine these two tools, then can you see some differences? Then for, for answer these questions, we studied some of the Hunt metal model calculation. And we see that if we combine these two theories, there could be some differences. For example, if this is a three band model system and we just calculate this phase boundary between the charge ordered phases and the uniform phases. And within the EDMFT, we have this kind of linear line phase boundary and within the GW, we also see the linear line phase boundary. However, if we combine these two methods and if we calculate this phase boundary, as you can see here, there is deviation of behavior from the EDMFT description as well as GW. And we found that if we combine these two theories, we are able to see the Hunt coupling induced uh, charge order instability enhancement. So if you combine these two theories, 
we are we should be able to see some differences in some systems. Okay, so I was I was showed you some several examples of the results that I got from our packages. I was trying to motivate you to use our packages, but beyond that, I need to give you some formal viewpoint on the various combination of the first principle method and the dynamic input field. And for that, let's start from the DFT plus DMFT approaches. Okay, to combine these two, we should understand the, the individual component first. There are so many different ways to understand the dynamic identity functional theory, but one way to understand it is using the free energy functional. So free energy functional in terms of, this is the DFT free energy functional, the functional of the local density and exchange correlation potentials. And if we write it in terms of Green's function, and its final form will be like this. So we have many different Green's function here and, the, and then Kunshan potentials. It looks horrible, but however, it is not that horrible if we know the physical meaning. So first two terms show just the free energy functional contribution for the independent Kunshan particles. So if we just have Kunshan particle and we say that based on this mean field, if we describe, uh, if we calculate this free energy, then this is a, the part, these two part. But however, in reality, there is additional contribution from the electron and electron interactions. So then what we have to do is from these two terms, we subtract the electron and electron contributions and we should calculate it properly. And this is the this term. And so this is the brief introduction to the free energy functional. And because we have two different arguments here so that we should have a stationary condition with respect to these two variables. And from the first condition, we have the definition of the, the, the Kohn-Sham exchange correlation functional. And from the second uh, stationary condition, we see the definition of the local density from the, our full Green's function. But however, one thing we should remember is that within the density functional theory, we do not know the exact form of this uh, phi functional, which is contribution from the electron and electron interaction. So people use some approximations such as LDA or GGA. And if we have this, uh, but the way how we realize that stationary condition is a self-consistent loop. So we have definition of the local density and the uh, local density, and from the local density, we get the exchange correlation uh, functional uh, is potential, and from the potential, we calculate the Green's function. And if we solve this self consistently, this, this is the so called TFT self consistent loop. Okay, I give you some brief introduction to the density functional theory. So it's time to go on the DMFT if, uh, <coughs> approaches. So what we solve the DMF within the DMT approach is that in the simplest case, it will be Hubble model. So in this Hubble model, we have a non-local hopping term here, and we also have the electron-electron interaction term, which is local, and we have, we have a chemical potential term. But this is also a notorious hard problem to solve in two or three dimension, so that we should have some approximation. What dynamical mean field theory do is that they just assume that it is in the infinite dimension. What I mean by infinite dimension is when there is infinite number of nearest neighbor. So in that limit, this action is really simplified and this action can be divided into two terms. First term is so-called action term and the other one, the other term is so-called hybridization term. Okay, let's go take a look at in detail. So in this action, uh, atom terms, what we have is that we have on-site energy as well as we have electron and electron interaction term and there is no other. So it means that this is real atom problem. And then the hybridization term, what we have is that we can annihilate electron at some time t and later time we can create one. So it means that we have atom here in the real material. Uh, which is described by this atom action. And we can 
annihilate electron from the atom and put it in the bath or environment. And later time, electron propagate here and you can go back to atom and we can describe the interaction between this atom and the, all the last of the system uh, conveniently in this way. And sometimes people define so-called Bergerin's function or fermionic vice field uh, using this hybridization function here and the on-site energy here. Okay, I have one more question from Adam and he asked, how could you briefly comment on what kind of term would remain in an effective action in the finite dimensional cases. So in the finite dimensional cases, what will happen is that, so here in the hybridization term, what you have is that we can annihilate a single electron in the electron, uh, in the atom, and we just put it here. But in the finite dimension, uh, what happens is that we can create both two electron here, and we can put it in the bath, and we can create annihilate three electrons at the same uh, uh, in the in the in the atom, and we can put it in the bath and so on. So I will describe it later too. But does it make sense? Okay. So we doing this effective action, but the way you you can solve this effective action using the the impurity solver, which will be explained by Corey in the later part of this morning session. But the way how we solve the DMFT cell console loop is actually as follows. From the lattice Green's function, we embed the impurity self energy and we construct the full Green's function. From there, we construct the local Green's function. And from there, we calculate the bias field. And with this bias field, and then, and how about you, we can define quantum impurity problem. So from there, we get the impurity Green's function and we get the impurity self energy. And if we solve this type consistently, then this will be our final solution. But using this DMFT effective action, we can learn this kind of thing. So DMFT effective action provide an interpolation from weak to strong coupling. For example, in the non-interacting limit will be will correspond to the U equal zero. It means that if we, if in this case, self energy will be zero, so that we can have, we can handle this non-interacting limit within dynamic mean pair theory. And in the atomic limit, it means that hoping is zero. So the hybridization is zero. So it means that we will have only an uh, atom or uh, action of atom. And in this case, if we uh, solve it in this way, we will get dynamical but local self energy. And as I told you in the infinite dimensional limit, only the single particle hope and of the site. This is the uh, approximation due to the infinite dimensional limit. And this hybridization term will be self consistent, determined, self consistently determined by the self consistent loop. And you should be given. And in terms of the phi functional, the phi functional of the dynamical mean field theory will be all possible two particle irreducible, irreducible local diagram. Uh, composed of the local Green's function and, uh, and then how about you? Okay, so I described you two different components. One is the density functional theory and the other one is the dynamic mean field theory so that we should be able to combine these two methodology and we needed the concept of the quantum projection and embedding. So the, the, the problem is that uh, we divided our Hilbert space into two parts. One is the itinerant as well as the other one is the correlated. So dimensionality of the full Hilbert space will be different from the dimensionality of the uh, correlated subspace. So for example, if you have any matrix in the full Hilbert space, if we want to have the same quantity in the correlated subspace, we should do something. So here is an example. Let's just say that our Hilbert space dimension is two. Then we have correlated subspace here, and we have itinerant subspace here, and we have some uh, the off diagonal thing here. And let's just say we have some projection operator, which is one zero. Then from full Hilbert space to the correlated subspace, we can do this operation. Then we can only select out the matrix elements in the correlated subspace. And when you have correlated subspace elements and we want to put it in the full Hilbert space, 
and we can do this operation so that we can embed this quantity to the full Hilbert space as follow. Okay, so we have the DFT and the DMFT. So what you need to do is we should construct the free energy functional of DFT plus DMFT. So in this case, this will be the functional of four independent arguments. First one is density, and the second one is exchange correlation functional. This is for the DFT, and we will have local Green's function, and we will have local self-energy. But if I put tilde here, that means that it is local quantity. So in the cases, then our free energy functional will be will be will compose of all these terms. So as I told, this looks horrible, but this is not that horrible actually. So this first two term is contribution from the single particle Green's function. And from the single particle Green's function, we subtract the electron electron contribution from these two terms. And then we correctly uh, incorporate the electron and electron contribution from this pi, pi phi functional of the TFT plus TFT, which is the functional of density and local Green's function. And because we have four different arguments here, we should have four different stationarity condition. And from the first condition, we have the definition of the exchange correlation function uh, potential. And from the second, we have the definition of this embedded self-energy, which is here. And from the third condition, we have dense, uh, definition of our density. And then the final equation just tells us what is the definition of our local Green's function. But the way how we realize this stationary condition is just solving this problem self-consistently. Uh, before that, I need to tell you something. As I told you, we do not know exact form of this phi functional of the TFT plus TFT. This is partly because we do not know the exact form of the, this functional of the TFT, even the TFT level. But what we usually approximate is that we just assume that this phi functional is composed of three terms. One is from the TFT, the other one is TMFT. And we, should, we should subtract the double counted terms. And in the cases from the this same stationary condition, we have still have the same uh, the exchange correlation functional definition. And from this stationary condition, we divide this embedded self energy into two parts. One is the impurity self energy, and second one is double counted self energy. So this impurity self energy is obtained from the DMFT self constant loop, and this double counting self energy. There are many different approximation, uh, but why one of the widely used one is the form of this one, and this n is the occupation of electron in the impurity site, and there's also some more advanced theory of so-called exact double counting, which is presented in this paper. Okay, so we have two different theories so that we should uh, combine these two, but the way how we uh, realize the, the stationary condition is, is using the set constant loop. But as you can see here, the first loop is for the TFT and second one is the, for the TMFT. And this is just combination of these two theory. And here we should uh, keep in mind that you and the double counting are external parameters in these cases. So, so far I have introduced you DFT plus DMFT methodology in a formal way. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. <laughs> Otherwise I will go to the next topic of the GW plus EDMFT. Okay, let me go on. So again, unfortunately, the easiest way to describe the, the methodology is the, the free energy functional, or this is type of this should be GW. But function, free energy functional within the GW, in this case, is we, it will be uh, functional of Green's function, self energy, and fully screen column interaction, and the polarizability. So in this case, it's in comparison to the TFT functional, we have much more terms, but idea is the same. The first two terms just tells us the contribution from the uh, single particle Green's function. And from there, we just subtract the electron electron contribution in this term. And the, all the last, we, this is electron electron interaction term. And instead of the phi functional, 
we just have these many terms with so-called psi functional, which is functional of a Green's function and fully screened Green interaction. But one good thing about this diagrammatic approach is that we, in this case, is in comparison to the dense functional theory, we know what is in this psi functional uh, explicitly. So this is the functional composed of the Green's function, screen column interaction, and also Green's function. Because we know what is in the psi functional exactly, so that stationary condition just tells us that what is our exchange, correlate, uh, exchange correlation self-energy, which is GW term, and what is the polarizability, this is GG term, and what is our Dyson equation for the uh, fermionic part, and what is our Dyson equation for the uh, bosonic part explicitly in this way. Okay, but the way how we realize stationary condition is still using the self-constant loop, and this loop is well described by Andre, so I will skip it. So we now next beast is extended DMFT action. So, so before we have talked about the dynamical mean field theory for the Hubbard model, but in these cases, uh, what it should solve is the extended Hubbard model. So extended Hubbard model is the extension of the Hubbard model in comparison to the Hubbard model, what we have is the non-local electron electron interaction terms explicitly here. So in with starting from this extended Hubbard model action, what it can do is the same. We just think about the infinite dimension limit where we have infinite number of the uh, next nearest uh, nearest neighbor atoms. So in that case is we can simplify this action uh, in, uh, a lot. And this EDMFT action will be composed of three terms. The first two term is the same as the action for the DMFT. But in addition to that, we also have so-called the dynamical term, which is described the electron-electron interaction between the empirical side and the bath or environment. Okay, I have a question here from Temuzin. Temuzin and Okay, so his question is how can we know whether to use TMFT, TFT plus TMFT or GW plus TMFT? So um, one of the point is that uh, from my point of view, which is to, which really like, who really like GW plus TMFT, I would like to tell you that whenever you can do, you'd better use GW plus EDMFT methodology. However, but in reality, in practice, what's prohibiting us to use GW plus EDMFT methodology is that computationally much, much heavier than DFT plus DMFT. For example, if you apply this method for the uh, two-dimensional system where we should have a large vacuum to calculate, then it is really almost impossible to uh, deal with this kind of two-dimensional system within the, within the GW plus EDMFT, so that in the cases you should use uh, TFT plus CMFT uh, uh, for your application. Did I answer you your question, Temujin? Okay. So we have the atom action and we have hybridization function and we also have a dynamical term here, but sometimes people use the different terminology like uh, combine these terms and they define so-called fermionic Bergen's function or fermionic vice field. And sometimes people define this U term and call it a bosonic Bergen's function or bosonic vice field. Okay, so we, we have this action, then the way how we solve this problem is that this kind of the same self constant loop. However, one thing you should notice here is that for the TMFT action, what it had is only the loop for the Green's function and self energy. However, in these cases, we, in addition to that, we have a loop for the uh, fully screen Coulomb interaction here and the impurity polarizability. So we have loop for the fermionic quantity as well as the bosonic quantity. So now we have the GW and EDMFT at the same time. 
Uh, but before that, I need to summarize the, the, the idea we can get from the EDMFT action. So what you can learn from EDMFT is that it also provides us, uh, us the interpolation between the weak to strong coupling limit. In the weak coupling limit, in the non internal limit, self energy will be zero, and the, in the atomic limit, hybridization and the dynamical term will be zero. So we can interpolate these two different limits at the same time. And we will get the dynamical, but local self energy as well as polarizability. And this delta hybridization function and the polarizability will be self constantly determined. And in terms of the psi functional of the local Green's function and local screen column interaction, it will be some of all possible two particle irreducible local diagram composed of local Green's function and the screen, uh, local screen column interaction. So we have all the components. So now it's time to put them in the same pot and mix them. But theoretically, it will be like writing the free energy function and over Green's function, self energy, screen column interaction, and P. This is exactly the same free energy function for the GW, but the difference is that what is in the Psi functional. So in the Psi functional, we have the GW Psi functional here, and we have EDMF Psi functional here, and we should subtract the uh, GW Psi fun uh, double counted Psi functional, which is a local GW diagram. And one good thing about this diagrammatic approach is that we know what is in each terms exactly so that there's no ambiguity uh, on what we should do here. So from the stationary condition, we have definition of the exchange correlation self-energy. We have GW term, we have self-energy from the impurity uh, DMFT action, and we also have a double, we should subtract the double counted uh, contribution, which is local GW, and we have Dyson indication for the fermion, and we have Dyson indication for the uh, boson, and we have so also definition for the polarizability. We have GW polarizability and polarizability from the EDMFT, and we also have subtract, should subtract the double counted polarizability, which is local GG term. Okay, this is the final e G double plus EDMFT self constant loop. So we have, as I showed you uh, in this loop, we have self constant loop for the boson as well as the fermionic quantity. Here, uh, what I mean by boson is a polarizability and screen column interaction and fermionic term, which means the uh, Green's function and the self energy. And starting from some Green's function and screen column interaction here, we take its local term and we define bosonic and the fermionic vice field. And from there, we can define the impurity action uniquely. And from there, we get the impurity Green's function and impurity susceptibility. And we get the impurity self energy and impurity polarizability. And we embed uh, from there, we define our lattice self energy and lattice polarizability from the GW's polarity self-energy and impurity self-energy, double counting in the same way here. And this is the, the projection operator for the boson and fermion. And if we solve it such consistently, then this will be GW plus EDMFT loop. Okay, any questions? <laughs> okay, let me continue. So, so far I have introduced you the full G double plus EDMFT idea. The idea is as simple. We just construct the, the free energy functional and we just determine what is in our psi functional and we subtract some double counted one and we can combine these two theories. Okay. So this is the same plot that I showed you. This is a full self consistency. However, one thing I should stress here is that this loop has never been realized in practice. So people, this is really hard to realize uh, computationally so that people are trying to approximate this methodology in this way. What they usually do is first, they just neglect the bosonic self-consistent loop. They just loop, neglect the loop for the bosons and they just keep the bosonic quantity at the GW level. And it means that 
but it means that to calculate the impurity action, we should have some mean to determine our bosonic bias field. But the way how get the bosonic bias field is from the constrained random phase approximation, which I will describe later, while uh, while using the constraint constrained density functional theory. And for the Green's function, what they do is instead of st starting from this whole loop, what they do is they starting from some mean field and they try to embed the impurity safe energy as a one shot correction to the uh, TMF, uh, this mean field Green's function. For the choice of the one shot Green's function, one shot Green's function, there are many different uh, choices such as one shot GW, screen the exchange, QSGW, LQSGW, and non-local version of these two. But here I should stress that there is a more advanced method, which is so-called multi-tier GW plus EDMFT, which should be understood as the, the, the full GW plus EDMFT approaches only in the low energy space. Uh, so this is not a full version. However, this is definitely advancement from uh, these approaches. So, but however, if we stick to this flow chart, then our, our question will be, what is the best mean field? What is the best mean field I mean, better than DFT, <laughs> DFT or hot triple? So there is well-defined way to construct the mean field green function, which is as follows. So idea is like this. So this is a typical spectral function for the interacting system which is composed of the quasi particle P and the incoherent contribution as a background. So what you would like to do, is first, we should like to filter this incoherent contribution. We just want to neglect this. And then because electron weight in this quasi particle P will be not one, it will be less than one. So we want to rescale that electron weight in this quasi particle P will be one. But in practice, how we realize it it as follows. But before that, I have a question from Adam. Okay, let me read it. Uh, have there been any investigation for simple model about the effect of the approximation men mentioned before the full GW plus EDMT loop? So, okay, so Adam asked about uh, whether such an approximation which is simplified to GW, full GW plus EDMFT is, is one we can trust by applying this one to simple system. Uh, in the model level, I have never seen it, but however, what you can see there is that applying this method to real material, which is simple in, in a sense that we have about two or four number of uh, atoms in, in the unit cell. When you apply it, in the most cases, we see the improvement of the results. As I showed you before, I showed you iron antimony two, and then the uh, lantern copper oxide, and then it was good. And another way to answer this question is as follows. So as I told you, in the full self in this loop, what you can see here is that it can be understood as the one shot correction to the sum mean field. But what it means is that this can be understood as an approximation idea that self energy can be divided into two parts. For the non local term, we can neglect the frequency dependence. And for the local term, we can only, uh, for the local term, for the only local term, we can include the uh, frequency dependence in this way. So this kind of division idea has been uh, uh, has been tested many times, but one of the recent uh, approaches is done by Gabi and his colleagues, including me, and they apply this kind of idea to uh, lithium iron arsenide, and they just check this kind of locality of assumption idea, and they validated it. And when they use this idea, it seem, uh, their conclusion is that starting from LQSGW, and if they use this kind of one-shot correction, the results of uh, this approximation are working well. I hope I answered your question, Adam. And I will go to next question from Nicholas. And his question is, his question is, which part of the full loop is actually the bottleneck? 
the QMC solver. Okay, so it will depends on the system. For example, if we calculate the open D software system, then actually GW is the board lab. <clears throat> so that so that GW part is more time consuming. However, if we want to calculate the app system where we have uh, <clears throat> where we have a 14 single particle system in the app shell. In the case is definitely QMC is a bottleneck. Uh, but this is a further description on the simple system where we have uh, one or two or three atoms in unicell. However, if we want to do much bigger and bigger and bigger system where we have many atoms in, in the unicell, then definitely GW part will be the bottleneck because the scaling of the GW is much worse than the, uh, the DMFT part because DMFT part we can just scaling is linear. I hope I answered your question, Nicholas. Okay. Let me continue. So we have, but further this kind of mean field construction, <clears throat> we have well defined way, which is there's filtering and rescaling, starting from the Green's function where we have interacting a frequency dependent self energy. What we first do is we just linearize self energy near the chemical potential. And we only put the, keep the first order term. And this will correspond to this filtering. And then we just reorder the terms. And if we, we define the single particle weight here, then this will be the final form after reordering the terms. So what you can see is that after we linearize self energy, we have frequency term here but we have term which is not depends on the frequency, which means that this could be understood as our quasi particle Hamiltonian with the weight of Z. But after that, we should do the rescaling so that we just change the weight to G to one. Then we have quasi particle Green's function where we, it can be described as I omega M minus quasi particle Hamiltonian, which is Hermitian. So in this way, in this way, if you have any interacting Green's self energy, which is frequency dependent, then we can linearize it, and then we can construct the uh, quasi particle Hamiltonian. But we should remember that to make this approximation holds, uh, we should not have any force near the, the the zero frequency energy. And we have one more question from Wei Guo, and let me read it. Uh, uh, so I think his question is this, how this method compared to the subspace EG plus EDMFT? So I think what he's telling me subspace EDMFT is the multi-tier EDM, G double plus EDMFT. So is it still possible to capture the satellite band for the strontium vanadium oxide? But however, the thing is I have never tried strontium vanadium oxide within these approaches. So I cannot give you some finite, some 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 well defined answer, but what I can tell you is that we have to do some validation project against the experiments as I showed you before, iron antimony two and the lantern copper oxide for this particular system was, for example, these two system it worked reasonably well. Uh, that I hope this answered your question way. Okay. So we have, finally we have the, but <clears throat> our particular choice is linearized quasi particle self constant GW as our mean field Green's function. So this is the GW loop. However, one important thing is that whenever we need G, instead of G, we use G quasi particles. And we get, the, when we get the self energy, then we linearize the self energy and we define our quasi particle weight. And in this way, we define our quasi particle Hamiltonian and we define our Green's function, quasi particle Green's function, which is different from the fully interacting Green's function. And if we solve this out consistently, then this will be the GW, so called L plus GW, which means linearize quasi particle self consistent uh, GW method. Okay. Then people might ask, why not one shot GW? But as Andre stressed, one shot GW strongly depends on the starting point. And uh, depending on the different DFT starting point, as you can see here, their gap value changes a lot in these cases. 
So we didn't choose the LK, uh, one shot GW as our starting point. And so now we have our mean field starting point so that we should have some way to define our projection operator, which is FK that I described it before. But the way how we construct FK is the Banyan function. The Banyan function idea is that for the low energy space, we can construct a localized orbital. But the way how they construct the localized orbital is first, they define so-called the total spread of the each localized basis set and they want to minimize it. But at the same time, they want to have some put on constraint that it preserve the band energy in some low energy window. So in this way, we can construct a of, uh, the projector. Our default choice of the inner frozen, so-called frozen orbital for the constraint, it is plus minus 10 EB. Then from there, we just take a look at atomic orbital character and we define what is our correlated orbital is. Uh, so this will be our choice of a projector. And another reason why we are using Banye function is that it can do Banye interpolation. So practical reason why is that when you calculate the GW band structure, what I mean by GW is LQS GW, this is computationally really heavy so that it's hard to get the Hamiltonian in a really fine K point. So we should have some means to interpolate quasi particle Hamiltonian in a really fine K point, and this will be Banyan interpolation. The Banyan interpolation idea is as follows. The more localized autonomous basis set means in the real space, if we write the Hamiltonian, then it will be really sparse matrix so that we can arbitrarily increase the, uh, the, the Hamiltonian matrix in the real space easily, then we can go back to the really fine K point with, then we can get really fine K point Hamiltonian with this localized basis. And we have projector and we have mean field so that we should have some means to uh, evaluate our, uh, our uh, bosonic bias field then the way the choice of our bosonic bias field will be CRPA. So the idea of CRPA is as follows. They want to calculate the effective interaction between correlated orbital. However, interaction between this correlated orbital will be bare with respect to the correlated orbitals, but it should be renormalized with respect to the rest. So if we use this idea, then what it means is that in practice, when you calculate the GW polarizability within RPA, we, we can divide this term into two parts, so-called low energy polarizability and the high energy polarizability. The low energy polarizability will be polarizability due to the uh, uh, transition between the correlated bands and then the high energy polarizability will be the rest. And we, we just subtract the low energy polarizability from the full polarizability. And then we can construct the so-called partial screen cone interaction. And if we take its local term, then this will be our choice of the bosonic bias field. However, I should stress that this is a choice of our bosonic bias field. And this is not the same as bosonic bias field we will get from full GWC EDMFT idea. And we have also question from Adam. Let me read it first. Uh, his question is, is this. Uh, he wants to make a comparison of the Banyan function constructed from two different electronic structure methods. One is a DFT, and the other one is the LQSGW. So his question is, uh, if we construct the Banyan function with an LQSGW, then does it more tightly bound to the atom in comparison to one from the TFT. Uh, but I didn't take a look at it in that sense in detail. But what I remember is that they are quite similar. I cannot say that which one is more strongly tightly bound or not. There could be some tendency, but I didn't take a look at it. But I, what I remember is only the spread, fun uh, the, the spread of the each Banyan function. But what I can say at this point is that they are similar. They are not that different. Did I answer you, Adam? OK. So the last piece is the double counting energy. 
So double counting energy that I told you is the local GW diagram. So from the local GW, uh, local Green's function, and then the U, we can construct the Hartree term and we can construct the GW term in this way. So this will be the final set console loop within the LPS GW for scheme FT. First, we solve LPS GW for material, then we construct the projector using Banyan function construction. And then from there, we define what is our low energy polarizability is, and then we calculate the bosonic vice field within CRPA as a choice. Then we calculate the double counted self energy. And then from there, we can define what is our, uh, the, the Fermi vice field is, and we know what is our bosonic vice field from the CRPA. So then we can solve the impurity problem, uh, unique, which is uniquely defined. And from there, we get the impurity self energy. And if we solve this self consistently, then this will be our LQSGW plus GMFT solution. But one thing we can notice here is that uh, there is no external tune knob. So if you just press the enter, then that's it. That's the answer. We have no external knob like U or double counting energy. This will be all calculated. Okay, as a final slide, I prepared this one. So idea of the combining first principles and then, then dynamical mean field theory is that this is uh, orbital dependent method. What I mean by orbital dependent method is that we should choose our correlated subspace. But when we make a choice of the correlated orbital, we should do it self consistently so that once we choose self uh, orbital, then all the parameters associated with it, such as the uh, bosonic vice field as well as double counting, should be determined self consistently so that the final answer should not depend on the choice of the correlated orbital. As a demonstration proposed, what I did is for the lantern cup oxide, we constructed a binary function in four different uh, energy windows. One is minus four to four, second one is minus six to six, a third one is minus eight to eight, the last one is minus 10 to 10. But after we construct this Fania function in this different energy window, what it means is that in this case is uh, copper D atom will be really tightly bound, but in this case is copper D atom will be really uh, extended in comparison to the one here. But after that, after construction of the Fania function, we determine the U and double counted self energy self consistently in an in approach that I have described before. And we calculated its total density of state as well as its local density of state to the nickel dx square minus y square. So interestingly, what you can see is that if the parameters are determined self consistently, then this low energy behavior, which is the charge transfer gap are insensitive to the choice of the Fania function. However, the high end of the feature, such as the position of this kind of lower half of the band shift. However, this low energy physics does not change much. So that here we should remember that when you do use different <coughs> orbitals uh, for as our correlated orbital, we should make a choice for the uh, associate parameter wisely so that it doesn't change it's a low energy behavior. Okay, if, is there any other questions? Okay, if not, then from now on, Corey will give you uh, some introduction to the CTQMC solver. Uh, Corey is uh, all yours now. Okay, thanks, Sam. I will stop sharing slide. This look good, son. Everything. Yes, works. yes. We, I can see your mouse pointer, and it's working now. Great. 
All right, so uh, hello everyone. I am Corey Milnick. I uh, work on the Continuous Time Quantum Monte Carlo or CTQMC solver, which is what we uh, use to solve the quantum impurity problem, which so far has uh, sort of been described as a black box. And here I'm going to try to give you some insight into what exactly is happening and how we're solving this problem and what some of the limitations are the bottlenecks and that sort of thing. Um, so to start, I'll uh, remind you of the context about why we're talking about CTQMC. Uh, go back over a little bit of the background. You've now heard a few times, but I think it's good to remind ourselves of, and then get dive into CTQMC. So how is it actually solving this problem? How are we measuring self-energy or other observables? Um, and what are the limitations? Uh, of the solver. What sort of problems can't we solve? Um, what sort of observables can we solve? That sort of thing. Um, I don't have time for questions at the end or any time in between. So um, please type in chat as you have been doing if you end up having some questions. Uh, and Song will let me know. So the context here is we have our um, solver, DFT plus DMFT or GW plus DMFT. So there's some loop on the side solving the itinerant electron problem. And then we have the other side, the DMFT side solving the local problem, uh, the correlated problem. And in this loop, there's sort of one side, which is to incorporate the behavior of the itinerant bath and calculate a new uh, fermionic vice field, or in the case of GW plus DMFT, also a bosonic uh, vice field, and turn this into a quantum impurity problem. And CTQMC then deals with this. And from the description of the quantum impurity and the vice fields, it computes the observables that um, the sort of plus needs DMFT plus DFT or GW plus DMFT. So the self energy or susceptibilities. Um, it can also provide other information that you might be interested in, like um, valence histograms describing what multiplets are occupied on your um, correlated atoms and that sort of thing. There are other solvers for quantum impurity problems. There are sort of approximate solvers, which are much faster, like the OCA or Hubbard one. Um, and there are other exact solvers, which just diagonalize your correlated impurity problem, or uh, NRG, which uses renormalization um, to solve the problem. And then there's CTQMC or other quantum Monte Carlo solvers. Um, why CTQMC? Well, it is exact uh, in the sense that if you give it sufficient time, it will eventually converge to the exact solution. It's sampling all of the diagrams, uh, whereas these approximate solvers are sort of limiting what diagrams you're actually looking at, and it can handle real materials. Um, so NRG is limited to maybe three bands, whereas we need to handle uh, F-shell problems with 14 orbitals. Uh, and the, the Hilbert space scales like two to the N, so that's a just way bigger problem that energy can never handle. Um, and the same issue faces exact diagonalization, where because we have so many bath states that we want to describe in DFT, um, the, the full Hilbert space that ED would have to deal with is uh, too large to really diagonalize. Whereas CTQMC lets us distribute this problem into a sort of a stochastic uh, sampling of all the diagrams and all this Hilbert space and lets us um, use this action where we've integrated out the bath degrees of freedom. Uh, and the whole approach is just extremely parallelizable, which is nice. So each CPU we have can solve the problem with no communication. So you can use 
all of a supercomputer essentially with no drawback. Uh, and the, the bottleneck in the computation is also acceleratable. So uh, I've gotten up to 225 times acceleration with our GPU code um, for sort of the hardest problem I've tried. Um, although this is sort of less effective for D-shell materials, you can only get maybe five times acceleration and you can't really get any acceleration for easier problems than that. Uh, so this is sort of why we've chosen CTQMC and really I would say it's the de facto choice for people doing ab initio codes plus DMFT. So uh, what exactly are we solving? Uh, we're solving a so-called Anderson impurity model where we have, as has been described, some bath of states that can be described um, in a band model. We have an impurity with some energy levels. We have an interaction between those energy levels. And then we have hopping between the bath and the impurity states. And using path integral formalism, we sort of integrate out these path degrees of freedom. All of these bands and hopping parameters get combined into a hybridization function and a vice field, so our sort of dynamical mean field. Additionally, we can have, instead of the static U, some dynamical interaction if we're dealing with GW plus DMFT or let's say an electron phonon interaction, some sort of bosonic bath as opposed to the fermionic bath that the itinerant electrons represent. Um, so when, what are we saying when we're solving this? We're not actually diagonalizing the Hamiltonian because it's impossible, more or less. Um, what we're doing actually is collecting the observables we actually need. So um, in the case of DFT plus DMFT, we just need the self-energy. So solving your purity problem means calculating whatever correlation or vertex functions you need to do whatever science you're trying to do. So uh, it means getting the one particle Green's function or the two particle Green's function, some susceptibilities, some self energies, maybe a two particle vertex function, um, maybe heat in vertexes. And here I'm showing sort of some of the results that CTQMC will provide. So this is for a very simple problem where you can actually use exact diagonalization, which is the black line. So this is the, the real result. And there are sort of different methods you can use, CTQMC can use to measure the self-energy, some of which are better than others, as you can see. So there's something called a worm measurement, which is this open square. And you can see in the time I've given the CTQMC, I do not converge very well to this exact solution, except for at very low frequencies where you can see it matching pretty well. Um, but there are sort of improved measurements you can make in the partition space, uh, which I'll describe more, which do pretty well. And this is just uh, a problem where I've given very little time to the solver so I can show sort of the failings. Uh, this problem is so easy that really all of these will converge pretty quickly. The other thing I wanna mention here is how hard is it to solve these problems really depends on the observable you actually want to calculate. So the more operators, the more times, the harder it is to calculate the function. And vertex functions like the self-energy or a gamma, the two particle irreducible vertex, these are much, much harder to calculate than their one particle equivalent. So the Green's function will, will converge uh, orders of magnitude faster than the self-energy. And that's because if we look at the Dyson equation, we have this difference of inverses. And both of these functions are going to zero as the frequency goes to infinity. So this difference of inverses is extremely sensitive to error in G. Similarly, the same is true of the two particle irreducible vertex, only now we're dealing with susceptibilities that are harder to compute than Green's functions. So it's even worse. Um, the other thing I sort of want to mention that 
you get with susceptibilities is you can see this looks like I've converged very well, except for maybe at high energies where you can see some, or high frequencies where you can see some error. Um, but there's actually a lot of error at the static zero frequency component too. So bosonic quantities have the sort of dual problem of it's hard to converge high frequencies and it tends to be hard to converge uh, static frequencies as well. Um, so how do we actually solve this problem? The idea is to divide our Hamiltonian into two parts. One which is we know how to solve and one which is easier to solve if we're sort of sampling its expansion. So we expand our partition function in orders of this second part of our Hamiltonian, HP. And now we have this integral over expansion orders, K, and all of these diagrams with different times, um, tau sub k. So essentially, we have diagrams that look like this with different flavors, creation and annihilation operators. And each of these diagrams, we can sort of reformulate as weights in this integram. So instead of thinking of them as this complicated trace, we just say, um, we have some weight associated with the diagram in the partition function. All right. Now we'll use, what's the song? Can you hear me? Oh, there is two questions from Sung Sop Lee. And it's about, the, can you see the chat box? Or... Can you see the chat box when you're oh, in? You just click it. In the bottom there is chat. If you click it, it'll pop up. Let's see. My uh, PowerPoint, oh, there we go. Oh, do you see that? Yeah, it's yeah. from Sung Sop. You have two questions. Sure. Okay, so the question is on this slide. Um, is the data shown on the slide obtained directly via an inversion or using the equation of motion method, so called uh, improved estimators or self energy trick? Um, there are different methods. So Open circle is direct inversion and closed circle is the improved estimator uh, or equation of using the equation of motion, uh, which I'll talk about how this is done later. Similarly, we have worm measurements of the Green's function and then you use the inversion and the Dyson equation, or you can use the worm method into the improved estimator space, which is the closed squares. And you can sort of see uh, based on the name improved estimator, you might assume it's better. And indeed, you can sort of see these closed squares and closed circles are doing better. And I'll talk about why that is. Um, it sort of alleviates this issue of comparing the differences between uh, inverse functions. Uh, but you still, it still holds that uh, self energies are much harder to calculate than uh, green functions. Uh, so why are worms worse than partition space measuring? Um, I'll talk about this later. The, the brief uh, comment is when we're doing partition space sampling, we get to make uh, k minus two measurements every time we sample where k is the expansion order. So let's say I'm looking at a real material. My expansion order is maybe 100. I get 98 data points when I sample my configuration, whereas when I do a worm sampling, I get one data point. Uh, I'll talk about why we still use worms. Um, typically, you don't use them for the Green's function, but you need them to sample some things like um, parts of the two particle Green's function you can't sample in partition space. And this all this terminology might seem uh, confusing. So hopefully it gets cleared up as I go through this talk. So uh, back to this uh, basic idea. The, the method we use, the, the separation into Hamiltonian parts is based on, we have HA, which is our local or atomic Hamiltonian, which we know how to um, diagonalize and solve easily. 
and we have our hybridization functions, which will be our HB, which we'll expand in. So these lines I'm drawing here are the hybridization lines. So for a particular diagram, we have all of the possible combinations of hybridizations that we're going to have to include in this uh, this weight, which will look like something like the determinant of a hybridization matrix, which sort of has all the values of these hybridization lines. And then we'll have a weight associated with this local Hamiltonian, which will look something like uh, the multiplication of a lot of matrices and some propagators. So we have this integral of over weights and the sort of Monte Carlo approach to this is to just say we're going to create a Markov chain of links of diagrams. So we'll have one diagram and then we'll propose changes to this diagram. We're going to insert two uh, operators at two random times. And we're going to see what's the weight of this configuration compared to where we started. Uh, we'll use the Metropolis Hastings algorithm to sort of account for the probability that we've proposed this, uh, this insertion and the probability of sort of proposing their removal to make sure we have a balanced uh, rate of acceptance. And then we'll randomly, we'll take a random number in between zero and one and just see, do we accept this move? And so we'll create this link for this chain of diagrams that we've sampled through by inserting operators, by moving them in the imaginary time axis, by removing them or whatever other moves we want. Um, and as we do this, we're essentially sampling the uh, partition function and all the configurations that it could have. Um, and here's a little bit more detail about what these weights are. So we separate them into this local and this hybridization part. If we have a dynamical interaction, we could add another part, which is the sort of dynamical uh, interaction weight. Um, and then we can compute these weights the local one is the so-called local impurity trace, which I said is sort of this multiplication of a whole bunch of matrices. These um, operators are represented in some basis in the local Hilbert space, and they have some propagator um, to deal with the, the imaginary time representation. So we multiply all these matrices, take their trace, and now we have our weight. And for the hybridization matrix, the hybridization weight, we get what essentially is the multiplication of a lot of hybridization lines, um, which if we store these values in a matrix, is just the determinant of that matrix. So with this, we can sample partition space, but we still need to know how to actually collect our observables. And the idea here is to insert our observable into our uh, action or into our um, expansion of the partition function. And we can reformulate the sort of our estimate of the observable as some uh, random variable sampled in the configuration space of the partition function which are the same weights that we've been evaluating the whole time. So the job we need to do is figure out what these random numbers are, which is the ratio of the weight with the observable versus without. So for example, we can look at the one particle Green's function and we have essentially the weight with two local operators that are not hybridized to the bath added to the current configuration X. And what is the likelihood of this configuration compared to our current configuration? Um, but it's much easier to remove hybridization lines and it solves some problems with this sort of adding operator approach um, to just get rid of some hybridization lines. Look at our current diagram and say, what's the likelihood of this diagram if we pretend two of these operators are just local operators and not hybridized operators. Um, 
And then what we have is an estimator that's something like the ratio of determinants, one with our current hybridization matrix and one with our hybridization matrix uh, minus a certain uh, column and row associated with these hybridization lines we've cut. This ratio we'll call M. And this is something that we're computing the entire time we're sampling. Because when we insert new operators, we're also calculating this ratio. So this is a really easy thing to sample um, in a good CTQMC implementation, because we already have this M inverse stored more or less. So we go through sampling our configuration space. And then every once in a while, we collect an estimate of the Green's function contribution from this diagram. We look for the current diagram, what time bins are our um, operators in to give us um, delta tau, what's the weight of that this adds to our estimation of G, and what sort of flavors are we cutting hybridization lines from. Although in practice, we're not using time bins. We're doing this on the Matsubara axis. So we're just taking the Fourier transform of this. Or maybe we use a more advanced idea like Legendre polynomials, which might give us some filtering of our high frequency data. Um, there are also some kernels you might use, which are even more compact, um, which I won't get into here because they're uh, much more complicated. But there's some limitations to this. This, by the way, is sort of the partition space measurement that I um, showed in the original slide. But there are some limitations. Um, first, if the weight of the partition function goes to zero and the weight of the observable doesn't, we won't be able to sample it. Um, if we look at this sort of expression, we can immediately see the problem. Uh, if this is zero and this is not, we're not going to be able to measure this well or at all. Uh, it's not a problem in DF DMFT because if the hybridization is going to zero, then the Green's function is also going to zero. And so there's no issue. Um, the only real problem happens if we're in the atomic limit where the hybridization is extremely small. Uh, and then these sort of inverse, uh, or this reliance on hybridization is going to cause problems. Essentially, we'll have very rarely will we ever generate diagrams with any, any operators in them. So we'll never have a chance to cut hybridization lines because the hybridization is so weak. And you'll never get a good measurement of G. Otherwise, it's fine. This isn't really a problem in real materials. Your hybridization is typically more than strong enough to use this partition space measurement, unless you're at extremely high temperatures. Um, it is an issue, however, in GW plus DMFT. So we can have components of the two particle Green's function, GIJKL, that aren't zero. Uh, in particular, we can have gij equals zero for i not equal to j and delta kl not equal to zero for k not equal to l. Um, but we can have two particle correlations induced by the interaction tensor. So we'll get non zero gij kl, but zero delta ij delta kl. So we won't be able to trim hybridization lines and measure arbitrary GIJKL. Typically, it would be limited just to GIIJJ. Um, so we can do some limited version of GW plus DMFT, but not, not really what we want. Um, additionally, measurement gets pretty painful um, with this partition space me measurement, because there are so many combinations of hybridization lines to cut. Um, so many time indices, potentially, if we're looking at three or four time Green's functions. Um, so there are problems with this partition space measurement. Uh, and this is where the worm algorithm comes in. 
So we sort of go back to this idea that it's easier to remove hybridization lines and we don't want to just insert new operators. And we say, actually, maybe we do want to insert new operators. So we're going to take a diagram that we have, our current configuration we've generated based on the partition function. And now we're going to say, let's try adding just two local operators, which are not hybridized to the bath at two random times. And we'll use our Metropolis Hastings algorithm. We'll use the relative weight of these two diagrams to decide whether we want a so-called worm into this new configuration space, which is not generated by the partition function, but by the partition function plus the observable operators. And we can use this idea to worm into any, any observable space. Um, and we see here now, instead of looking at the ratio of the hybridization functions, we're looking at the ratio of the local traces. So it doesn't depend on whether our hybridization function has gone to zero, but on our atomic Hamiltonian. Um, and here is sort of the overview of all of the spaces our CTQMC can sample um, and how it can move between them. So we have this normal CTQMC, which only samples the partition function space, but now we can sort of worm into one particle Green's function space or two particle Green's function space or um, a two particle Green's function space where we're in a particle particle channel and we only have two times uh, or a particle hole channel where we only have two times or sort of the so-called heat in channels where we have three times in particle particle or particle hole or we have all of our improved estimator spaces that we can warm into. Um, we just have to be careful that these configuration spaces can be very different sizes. So the partition function space can be 10,000 times larger than the Green's function space. And so we'll never end up warming into Green's function space. And we need to use the Wang Landau algorithm to sort of normalize all of these spaces. Um, you can read about how we do that in our uh, preprint here, which should be up on CBC soon. Uh, the nice thing about this is measurement is very trivial. All we have to really do is count how often we enter a worms function space and into what sort of flavors we're going. And we now have our estimator. And we can Fourier transform this or put it in the Legendre polynomial basis, whatever we want. But all we have to do is count. So measurement is extremely quick. The downside is that we only get one measurement when we take a sample instead of the k measurements we get from cutting hybridization lines, which is why we have these worm measurement open squares, which look horrendous compared to the partition function space measurements, which is just these cutting of hybridization lines. So the open circles, which are not great, but are, you know, uh, orders of magnitude better than the worm measurement. Because, in fact, we are taking, I think in this case, around 16 measurements every time we sample on average versus the worms one. Um, but now we still have to describe uh, what are these improved estimators which are doing better. Um, so sort of as I described previously, we have the Dyson equation, which causes some problems because we're looking at the difference of inverses. And if we look at this Green's function, sort of going to zero with one over omega squared. So now we have an omega squared in our error, um, which uh, if we have to go to high frequencies means we're going to have large errors no matter what we do, unless we sample for you know, billions or trillions of Markov chain links. So it's much better if we can sample something like G times sigma, where sigma is now inverse of G times G sigma. And if we do some math, we see now our error is only linearly increasing with the frequency, which is obviously vastly superior. Um, 
which now has two errors, but the errors are not, are pretty small. So this is the this omega is what we really care about. And you I mean you can see here the improved estimator, which is this G sigma method, does so much much better for the worm. We can see we're almost doing as well as the partition space measurement, or just as well, which is you know 16 times more measurements than this improved estimator in the worm case. And if we use the partition space. We have quite good agreement, even though I'm not giving this CTQMC run enough time, even though I'm sampling all of these spaces at the same time, uh, which is a little inefficient. We generate these improved estimators uh, using the equations of motion, um, as the original questions have suggested. And what comes out of this is we replace our first operator with the commutator of the operator with the interaction tensor. Um, so we can generate these improved estimators for any of our observables that we're interested in sampling. So G sigma, for example, for the one um, particle irreducible vertex, or H functions for the two particle irreducible functions. Um, so if we want, uh, susceptibilities or the irreducible vertex, this will give us uh, much better results. So now I think is a good time to talk about the limitations. So the first, which if you've uh, ever looked into this field or CTQMC, you've probably heard about, sort of the sign problem. So I've ignored a big issue here um, by just pretending that these configuration, configuration weights are positive, which is what the metropolis hasting algorithm requires. In reality, we're dealing with fermions, so we often have configuration weights that are negative, uh, which means we can't use this algorithm. Uh, what CTQMC does is to just say, we'll take the absolute value of these configuration weights. And then we'll renormalize our estimators by the current sign of the configuration. And we'll measure a sort of the average sign to reweight at the end. But this causes severe problems if this average sign is low, uh, close to zero. So, if we look at this expression for our new estimators, if the average sign is really small, if this new weight for each sample we're taking is small, we're sort of getting very little information each time we sample. So if, if on average this W over absolute value of W is 0 0.01, we're getting a hundredth of the information that we might have expected. And what's more, when we renormalize, we're going to have a very core estimate of the average sign because small fluctuations will cause massive renormalizations in our observable. So as the sign vanishes, uh, computational requirements sort of explode with one over the sign roughly. And so if we have an average sign of 0 0.01, now we need to use 100 times the computer power. Uh, and I would say that this is sort of, this is underselling the problem. Probably it's worse than this. Um, so what causes this and what makes it worse? Um, the bad news is that sort of low temperatures always do this. So CTQMC restricts us to not really going to extremely low temperatures. As the temperature vanishes, so will the sign unless we're solving a problem which doesn't have a sign problem, like let's say um, Hubbard model. It's simple enough that we're not gonna run into this, but with real materials, we always will. The other thing that really causes problems is off diagonal elements in the hybridization matrix. So if we have delta ij that aren't zero for i not equal to j, the sign will plummet. Um, in my experience with real materials, if you're doing sort of real interaction tensors and you have off diagonal elements, your sign 
uh, vanishes. It's almost impossible to solve these problems. Um, so what can we do? If you approximate our interaction and only use density density like interactions or icing interactions, your sign recovers quite a bit. Um, I'll get to Adam's question in a second. Uh, the other thing that helps is the basis, or helps or hurts, I would say. Um, so certain problems we have natural basis, which seems to help with sign problem. So if we're looking at iron and we're looking at a relativistic basis, um, sort of more complicated basis for this uh, material, and we'll get a pretty small sign. But if we look at a non-relativistic basic basis, we'll get quite high signs. Um, on the other hand, if we look at delta plutonium, we get uh, pretty high signs for various relativistic bases until we get to very low temperatures. Um, so it really depends on your material, whether uh, relativistic um, things will cause sign problems, in my experience. Um, there's sort of a, a physical basis that seems to, CTQMC seems to like a bit more. Um, shown here is also, we have two relativistic bases. One where we're sort of um, not including crystal field effects as much. So we've thrown away all the off-diagonals on the hybridization basis, on the hybridization uh, matrix because we need to to have a decent sign, but we've um, we've not done anything to sort of the typical JM basis for a relativistic problem. And we get a, a sign problem only when we get down to like uh, 50, 25 Kelvin. But if we use a rotation of our basis to sort of get rid of as many diagonals from the hybridization matrix as we can before throwing away the rest, and we include in a sense more of our crystal field effects, um, but we complicate our interaction tensor, we end up having a sign problem that arises a bit sooner, more around 100 Kelvin. All right, now I have a few questions. So I've heard of the complex Langevin and Lechitz thimble methods being used to suppress or eliminate sign problems in particle physics contexts. Um, do, do you know if that's being explored for the auxil auxiliary impurity problem the CTPMC solves? I don't. Um, I am not aware of anyone who's really found systematic ways to deal with the sign problem other than sort of severe approximations like I've discussed here, like just throwing away off diagonals or uh, non-icing interactions. Um, Alex asks, how serious is the sign problem when you include spin orbit coupling? So I sort of answered that. Um, it really seems to depend on the material. So I found that for iron relativistic uh, DFT plus DMFT, uh, I got a pretty severe sign problem, although it was still solvable. Uh, sign was right around 0 0.1, which is where I would consider it maybe worth still doing CTQMC, um, even at 600K. And whereas sort of non-spin orbit, uh, non-relativistic, the sign was very high. So here it, it is serious using spin orbit. Um, whereas for delta plutonium, uh, there's no problem at all. The sign is uh, very high in the relativistic basis. In fact, I, I would expect that the sign problem is worse than a non-relativistic basis uh, because the physical problem is well separated into the five half and seven half subspace for plutonium. Do you calculate the diagonal of orbitals when calculating with spin orbit coupling? Um, yes, you can not typically do off diagonal hybridizations or hopping elements. Um, when you're doing CTQMC, unless you approximate your interaction tensor. Um, you can do this 
if you want to look at the effect of these up diagonals, you can compare sort of the with the piecing interaction. Um, or you can do something like uh, this. So for this sort of symmetry adapted basis, we've rotated the JM basis so as to get more of the op diagonal elements onto the diagonal. We've sort of turned this full hybridization matrix into something tri diagonal. And then we only have to throw away some of the information. Um, and so that's about what you can do, um, or at least what we've done. I'm sure there is ongoing research as well into uh, more systematic ways to deal with this, but um, I haven't seen anything personally that looks uh, looks great at solving this problem. Um, so putting extra effort into localizing your one year functions, leading to more density density interactions helps with the side problem. Um, yes, I think choosing bases where you'll get more density density and less uh, non density density should help. Um, I don't know if I have a, a quantitative, you know, proof of this, but I would expect that it's true. Um, part of the reason why it might not be true is one of the things that this um, this gets for you, this icing density density restriction, is that you can decompose your Hilbert space uh, into um, uh, just subspaces of size one. So you're instead of multiplying matrices, you're just multiplying numbers. Um, and essentially you get without off diagonals, no side problem. And with off diagonals, uh, your subspaces are now based only on these off diagonal elements. And so your sign problem is only coming from them. Um, but I expect um, even just sort of collecting more and more of the weight onto these density density interactions will help. Um, I've only got a little bit more. Well, I guess really I have no time, but I would like to talk a teeny bit about the computational uh, bottlenecks if you want to stick around. Um, the, as I've sort of said, this local impurity trace uh, practically is calculated as the trace of the product of a whole bunch of matrices, which are in the basis, some basis in the Hilbert space, uh, and where we've sort of propagated uh, these operators. Uh, the problem with sort of a naive implementation is that if this if this M and N are states in the full Hilbert space, our operator matrices are of rank two to the N. So for an F shell system, you know, 16,000, this is something we can't multiply K matrices of that rank. It's just prohibited, especially when you consider that we need millions of configurations sampled to get good results. Uh, even if we use GPUs, we just can't do this. Uh, and the solution to this is to decompose the Hilbert space into sectors according to their symmetries. Um, and so now we have operators which act on one uh, sector of this Hilbert space and bring you to another sector. And these matrix matrices are of much, much smaller rank. So um, for this JM basis, let's say we're looking at rank 300. And for this, rotated basis, we're looking at uh, matrices of rank 800. So this is much better than 16,000, obviously, although it's still quite hard. Um, and the other thing we can do is to store subproducts of this uh, trace, because really we're only changing, we're only removing two of these matrices or inserting two new ones. And so only certain regions of this are changing each time we move. Uh, somewhere different in configuration space. So if we use like a binary tree or in our case, a skip list, uh, suddenly our scaling is log K 
okay, it's expansion order rather than just k. Um, for sprawl problems, like if you're just doing a Hubbard model, it's not this local trace, which is the bottleneck, but the computing the hybridization weights, which is the ratio of determinants, which scales like the expansion order squared if we're just doing uh, insertion of pairs or removal of pairs. Um, the other thing we can use is use GPUs. So GPUs are sort of tailored to deal with a bunch of matrix multiplications, um, but they're really going to outperform CPUs only when the matrices are large. So for these F-shell problems I've discussed, where we have, let's say, rank 800 or rank 300 matrices, the GPU sort of excels. And I've sort of, I've gotten up to 225 times acceleration for this symmetry adapted basis with rank 800 matrices, um, or 15 to 90 times acceleration for the um, natural jam basis, which has rank 300 matrices. Um, and for D shells, which are maybe rank 20 matrices, you only get one to five times acceleration. And if you go down to smaller problems, you actually get deceleration because you have some extra CPU GPU communication. The other way we just overcome it is it's just so massively parallelizable. So you're welcome to use all of Summit or all of whatever uh, computer resource you have. And CTQMC will scale pretty much ideally if uh, you sort of have long enough measurement phases to overcome the initial broadcasting of data or reduction of your um, estimators for the observables. Um, and sort of we're hoping to use some of these capabilities in ongoing projects we're doing on Summit, which are sort of reaching into the petascale computation. Um, and sort of all everyone's CTQMC that's out there has this massively parallelizable element, um, but ours is one of the only, only versions showing this sort of GPU. Uh, capabilities. And we also have some other unique capabilities like all of this form sampling, handling pretty uh, diverse set of impurity problems, handling these dynamical interactions well, um, which are also a reason to use RC to QMC versus some of the other options out there. Um, so if anyone wants to stick around and ask questions, feel free to. Otherwise, it is lunchtime. So uh, feel free to dip out if you want to. Uh, but thanks for listening. I'll be showing hands on examples of using this code in the afternoon. Or, I guess if there's no questions, uh, perhaps we'll just reconvene. Um, in the afternoon and you'll have another chance to ask me some questions and uh, get a look at how this is actually run. Uh, thanks for the uh, listening. See you later, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you at one.